up on lawmakers. The supplemental budget is headed for a conference committee. The House passes the governor's virtual school bill with a minor change. And a proposed crackdown on underage drinking. Those stories and more are next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers for Thursday, February 17th. Here are your anchors, Gerald Bryant and Nwandi Lawson. Good evening, everyone. Also on tonight's program, it's Legislative Day 20. We'll have a status update on some important legislation. And the Woman's Right to Know Act passes out of a House committee, but our top story tonight, the Senate passes the supplemental budget. Well, the state's mid-year, also called a supplemental budget, is headed to a conference committee. The Senate passed its version of the $16.5 billion spending plan today. We did our best to look at every, at every uh, change or every program to see did it benefit our state as a whole. And I can tell you there's a minimal uh, number of projects that, that maybe don't affect the state as a whole. I would tell you that this budget is lean and clean and is focused on education and children. Appropriations Chair Jack Hill said while the House version included a bond package for college and technical school construction, the Senate wants any bonds held for the FY06 budget. The House cut $5 million the governor recommended for the Department of Human Resources, and the Senate version of the mid-year budget restores $3.75 million of that. The other difference, of course, has to do with the Regents and part of the payday shift agreement with the Board of Regents and uh, the governor added some funds in to help the Regents with that shift. The House cut about three million dollars out of that uh, out of that uh, those nine million dollars. If that cut is not restored we believe that that three million will come directly out of instructional funds and could cause uh, possibly cause layoffs. Senate Democrats offered eight amendments that would have shifted money to programs in corrections, DHR, technical education, to name a few. All those amendments failed. Some Democrats also expressed concerns about too much bonded debt and a state reserve fund that once approached a billion dollars but has now dwindled to 52 million. This is the second year in a row now that we're going to have over a billion dollars in the bond package. And I could understand last year because we were coming out of the downturn in the economy rates were low, maybe we should have gone out and borrowed a little bit more money. The problem we have, is the chair, as the senator from the 14th pointed out, we have over almost $10 billion in debt now. We're reaching an all-time high in debt and an all-time low in reserve funds. Well, you know, the good news is we're on track. Uh, you know, the governor in his wisdom did not choose to spend to raise the revenue estimate uh, for the rest of this year. He chose to leave it pretty close as to, close to where it is now. Uh, what this will mean if we continue to grow our revenue at the 10, 11 percent rate, and we certainly hope that it does, uh, we'll generate uh, some double or triple our present uh, reserve by the end of this year. The final vote on the Senate version of the supplemental budget, HB 84, was 34 to 15. The Senate and House have both voted to adhere to their versions, and a conference committee will begin to work out the differences. The House today approved the creation of a virtual high school, allowing students to take advanced courses online. The House Education Committee added language to Senate Bill 33, which the chairman said would ensure that private and homeschooled students do not take slots from public school students. Right now, there are 900 that we're not even counting public schoolers that are taken in the metro area through their own virtual high schools. Great. So it's 500. Okay, so and the second question is, what if that is an underestimate? In other words, once the word gets around, if you have, let's say theoretically, uh, more public school children requesting than there are slots, then what is the uh, administrative uh, uh, decision-making process there to give priority yes. to public yes. school children? Well, this year, this year, there are going to be 2,000 slots. If those 2,000 slots fill up and there's 2,000 public schools, they've got the priority. And that, of course, a discourse between Representative Brooks Coleman and Representative Bob Holmes. The virtual high school would be funded according to the current quality basic education formula. Representative DuBose Porter introduced an amendment he said would protect small rural systems. I think with this amendment, we could be penalizing some systems that may be, and we're taking the flexibility from the state board to look at the program, look where the needs are, and I think if we do this we could be limiting some courses we could offer and we could not be totally reimbursing some systems that really needed it. But without this amendment we know we're going to penalize them by taking the FTE money. No we don't know we're going because we've got a commitment from our State Department and Mr. Porter, you, uh, Representative Porter, you know uh, the State Department they're going to follow through and they're going to do it and we're going to reimburse those costs. 
The Porter Amendment failed. Senate Bill 33 passed by a vote of 166 to 1. It returns to the Senate, where House changes are expected to be accepted. The governor's office says 60 virtual high schools will be available next summer. The Woman's Right to Know bill passed out of the House Health and Human Services Committee today. House Bill 197 aims to put a 24-hour waiting period on receiving an abortion and during the time the woman receives reading materials to educate her about the procedure. David Zelsky joins us live with details of that story. David. Well, thanks, Gerald. Representative Sue Burmeister sponsors House Bill 197 and mentioned that similar legislation has passed in states like Pennsylvania. She added that the educational material women receive during their waiting period is optional to read. I think we need to give them every bit of educational material at their fingertips so they truly know that when they choose abortion, this is what they're aborting. And I do not see that as an affront to the young lady or the woman making that decision. To me, it's an education to her and she can make the appropriate decision given all the information at her fingertips. Again, this is only given to her. She chooses to open it up and look at it at her own discretion. The bill started off even at the level where a rapist could actually sue uh, because uh, an abortion was, uh, was uh, actually performed. So anybody who starts off with a bill that harsh, even to get to where we are today, lets you know it was nothing about compassion. It was not about the woman's uh, right to choose. It was not about the woman's right to know. It really was just about limiting access to abortion, which is legal in the state of Georgia. Now, if the bill passes, the Department of Human Resources will handle the educational materials through websites and handouts. House Bill 197 now heads to House Rules. Reporting live, I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. David, I'm sure our viewers noticed that Representative Burmeister had some kind of printed material in her hand during the presentation. What was that? Yes, Gerald, that was actually an educational handout from a similar program in Ohio. All right, David, thank you very much. A National Review of State Academic Standards ranks Georgia's English and Math curriculum among the best in the nation. The Thomas B. Fordham Foundation gave Georgia a letter grade of B in math and English. The review covered new teaching standards that the Board of Education approved last year. The result of all that hard work, diligence, and concentration is now, I believe today, and what I think this survey or this uh, research study is going to show, is a guaranteed and viable curriculum that outlines specific guidelines for instruction, student work, and assessment. For a state that has looked to me from a distance away uh, as if it's been on kind of a kind of an erratic course sometimes over the years with respect to its education policies and its education reforms. Uh, I have the distinct impression now that uh, not only are your standards a solid to build a, a solid foundation to build a whole lot of other things on top of, and there are a lot of other things that need to be built involving teachers and curriculum and lesson plans and textbooks and tests and so forth and so on, uh, but you've actually got a team in place that uh, intends to do the whole construction process uh, and not just settle for the foundation. Only four other states in the nation scored higher in both subjects on the Fordham report card. A new subject that might be making an appearance on report cards soon is a student's body mass index, or BMI. House Bill 497 was introduced Wednesday and is raising many concerns. Lawmakers Angelina Washington has more. An A in English and a B in math, but an S in weight? House Bill 497 is a bill that would require schools to provide students' body mass index in each report card or grade report. It's me meant to make an awareness to the children and to the parents that choices need to be made where their health is, is in consideration. But many question whether this bill will help or harm. When we pass out report cards to all our students across the state of Georgia, it's to measure their achievement, not their weight. And for our kids to have to step on a scale, to have themselves weighed by a complete stranger, it's humiliating. Um, and I don't know, as a parent, I would allow my child to be weighed in school. Everybody needs to kind of just understand the intent of the bill and give us good suggestions. We want feedback from the parents. We want feedback from the community. This is not the first time child obesity issues have been introduced to the General Assembly. Legislation banning soda machines in schools and requiring recess in the past have failed. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Angelina Washington. 
Senator Casey Cagle and Representative Chuck Martin are sponsoring legislation they say will help reduce underage drinking and alcohol-related deaths in Georgia. Lawmakers Chris Knight joins us live with more. Chris. And, Monty, these bills would impose stricter penalties and hold both minors and adults accountable for the illegal consumption and purchase of alcohol. Underage and want a stiff drink? Think again. New legislation stiffens the penalties for minors caught consuming alcohol and for the adults who provide it. Senator Casey Cagle is sponsoring Senate Bill 205. What this bill will do is create a driver's license revocation for individuals who are allowing minors to consume alcohol, purchasing it for them, as well as those minors that are consuming the alcohol themselves. We're tying it to the driver's license because that's the thing that's the most important for those individuals. Similar legislation will be debated in the House. We're basically trying to stem the flow of alcohol to our underage uh, children in Georgia. Um, they're, they're getting the alcohol from various means, many times from adults, and we don't have the, a, a law on the book that allows them to actually be held accountable for consuming the alcohol. Those supporting the legislation hope that holding both adults and minors accountable will make for a safer Georgia. In fact, let's just face the truth. The truth is that if a kid's going to take the risk of drinking, they're going to take the risk of driving on our roadways. And keeping them from drinking is going to keep them from driving while drunk. And that's why it's important to all of us in Georgia. Because if we can keep those kids off the road while they're drinking, we'll reduce our crash deaths. It'll make our lives a whole lot safer on our roadways. Senate Bill 205 was introduced yesterday in the Senate. Representative Martin anticipates introducing similar bills as early as tomorrow. Reporting live, I'm Chris Knight for Lawmakers. Thanks very much, Chris. Well, the House today voted to close a legal maneuver which permits defendants in child abuse or neglect cases to use juvenile court records in their own defense. Representative Wendell Willard explains. Unfortunately, one of the things that we didn't recognize or think of that would happen has happened, and that is that the uh, juvenile court proceedings are being used by individuals who may potentially be the party charged with the crime, whether it be deprivation or child abuse. And they're attempting to use the juvenile court proceedings as a means of getting information and documents and statements uh, addressing what may have happened. And uh, the problem with that is the person who is asked for that data may in fact be the individual who, is, uh, who potentially may be charged with the criminal activity whether it be deprivation or child abuse. House Bill 222 passed without dissent. It now moves to the Senate. The House also agreed to require courts to proceed with the termination of parental rights within 90 days of filing. Current law instructs judges to expedite these matters, but it gives no time limit. The bill's sponsor, Representative Barry Fleming, said this will make foster children eligible for adoption sooner. The House agreed to House Bill 195 by a vote of 154 to 0, and it now moves to the Senate. The Senate voted today to legalize the sale of sparklers in Georgia. Senate Bill 133 is sponsored by Senator Don Balfour and endorsed by Senator Jeff Mullis, chair of the Economic Development Committee and a firefighter. We're talking about an economic development issue. Sure, it's a public safety issue. But we're talking about a sparkler or a sparkler related. Not a firecracker, not an explosive device, but a sparkler. The same intensity as striking a match. The only thing with sparkler, it burns longer. The, the flame lasts longer. But the, still the same intensity as a match. Do we outlaw matches? I don't think we need to. Senator Mullis went on to say that making sparkler, sparklers rather legal could mean sales in the millions of dollars. Senator Steve Thompson wondered if legalizing sparklers could lead to legalizing other fireworks. Let me ask you, this is not, though, in fairness, this is not what some people think in that we're trying to open the door to full-blown fireworks in Georgia. This is only sparklers, and you do not intend to come back and introduce a bill to expand this, say, next year as a door opener, do you? Absolutely not. This is not the slippery slope. This is only for sparklers and sparkler-related, which are non-explosive. And thank you for that question, but there's no plans, no intentions of mine uh, to introduce any other legislation regarding this. Senate Bill 133 passed 41 to 9 and goes to the House. 
Today, members of the Fulton County delegation heard a presentation about the possible fiscal impact to Fulton County if Sandy Springs were to become a city. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman was at that meeting, and he joins us now with more. Jesse. Well, thank you, Nwandi. Members of the Fulton Caucus heard from county officials as well as municipalities within the county about the financial loss they might take if Sandy Springs were to become a city. This Monday, an amendment to the incorporation bill, House Bill 36, shifted most of the financial burden from those municipalities to the Fulton government. In order to soften that blow, Representative Edward Lindsay encouraged Fulton County to come to the negotiating table. Uh, for this part, I'll say this is one of the drafts of the bill, as well as working with the other people who are more principal than me, I'm professional It is rather startling to me, and I'll say this also as, a, as not only an elected official here, but also as a resident of the county. It has really, really concerned me uh, that my county has not come to the table and at least sat down to talk to me. Even though it may appear, Mr. Lindsay, that we may be stonewalling or being hard-nosed, that's not the case. At the end of the day, we want the people in Sandy Spring, we want the people in Northwest Atlanta, Palmetto, Alpharetta, we want everybody to say they were acting in our interest. As House Bill 36 now reads, Fulton County officials estimate the county could lose $18.5 million in sales tax revenue alone. The bill is now in the hands of the House Governmental Affairs Committee. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Thanks so much, Jesse. Well, we're halfway through the legislative session. And that's a good time to take a look at our legislative scoreboard, the status of major legislation. We begin with the budgets. The supplemental budget has passed the House and Senate and is headed for a conference committee. The big budget for the coming fiscal year is in House Appropriations. Moving to business and economic legislation. The bill allowing Sandy Springs residents to incorporate is in House rules. The next step would be a vote on the House floor. House Bill 218, designed to attract business and industry while exempting some information from public records, cleared the House and is in Senate rules. SB 5, which would have created public-private partnerships to build public projects, died in committee after critics claimed it opened the door to abuse of eminent domain, the power of government to seize private property. Senate Bill 86, limiting the use of eminent domain, is in Senate rules. Next stop, debate in the full Senate. The Senate bill banning smoking in many public places is in Senate rules and expected on the Senate floor next week. SB 46, providing some privacy to cell phone users, is in Senate rules. Next stop, the floor of the Senate for debate. Also poised to go from Senate rules to the floor, the Slam Spam Email Act, aimed at protecting Internet users from junk email scams. Senate Bill 92, providing a below minimum wage 90-day training wage for young workers, passed the Senate and is in a House committee. The Governor's Statewide Tourism Marketing Bill cleared the Senate and awaits action by a House committee. Here's an update on Governor Purdue's major education bills. SB 33, creating virtual Internet classes, has passed the House and Senate and goes to the Governor to be signed. SB 34, recognizing master teachers and academic coaches, passed the Senate and resides in House rules. SB 35, allowing local school boards flexibility in spending some state funds, should be up for a vote before the full Senate next week. Moving to environmental bills. A House bill governing interbasin and intrabasin water transfers is in a House committee awaiting action. The River Basin Protection Act is also in committee. The Governor's Land Conservation Bill, House Bill 98, expands the green space program to the whole state. It's passed the House and Senate and awaits the Governor's signature. Meanwhile, the Governor's Ethics and Government legislation is still in the House Ethics Committee. Both the House and Senate reapportionment committees have plans to redraw Georgia's congressional districts. Senate Republicans already have a proposed map. Several social issues await action. House Bill 67 would keep cities from requiring private organizations and businesses to provide spousal benefits to unmarried couples. HB 197, the Women's Right to Know Act, requires women seeking abortions to be provided with specific information about abortion. It's passed out of committee. Senate Bill 77 is an abortion bill requiring parental or guardian consent. It's in Senate rules. Senate Resolution 49, the governor's proposed constitutional amendment, would allow state money to go to faith-based organizations to pay for social services. It failed to get enough votes on the Senate floor, was reconsidered, and sent back to Senate rules. Tort reform became the first bill signed this session by the governor. It changes medical malpractice law and sets caps on pain and suffering judgments. 
And rounding out our legislative scorecard, a couple of transportation bills. Senate Bill 4, changing the funding balance for federal and state road money, passed the Senate and went to the House. In HB 273, the Flex Auto Lane Bill passed the House and was sent to the Senate. And that's where some major bills stand on day 20 of this legislative session. The Small Business Initiative promoted by Governor Sonia Perdue cleared the House today. Representative Jay Roberts explained that House Bill 282 provides tax incentives for businesses that make capital investments of $100,000 or more. This bill is basically what it does is it takes the Georgia tax code and mirrors it with the federal tax code in the event that you go and make a $100,000 um, capital investment in your company, you can depreciate it out in the first year instead of over a 10-year period. That measure passed by a vote of 164 to 0 and moves to the Senate. The House also agreed to change the way development and construction bids are handled. House Bill 155 instructs state agencies to award contracts to the most qualified contractor, not necessarily the lowest bidder. The measure also reduces the maximum number of bids required from 8 to 5. Representative Earl Earhart told the House that the bill also expands the number of professions covered. It adds interior designers to the list of registered professionals who can uh, qualify to pursue state projects. And these are not uh, those who are considered decorators. These are registered and degreed professionals who, who have a certification in their respective field. And it's long past due that they were added to this list. The bill passed without opposition, and it now moves to the Senate. The House also agreed that the pictures of convicted sexual offenders can be published in local papers. Representative Sue Burmeister told the House that this would assist those who cannot access the online state registry. House Bill 188 passed 157 to 0 and moves to the Senate. And legislation was introduced today to prevent strip clubs from advertising on highway billboards. Representative Steve Davis of McDonough called these signs an embarrassment to the state. The bill bans roadside ads for clubs that have live nude or semi-nude dancers or go-go dancers. In other news, Senator Mitch Sebaugh today introduced a bill that he hopes will provide a financial incentive to bring more movie makers to Georgia. A tax incentive. It's really like a rebate. If they come to Georgia, they spend the money, they generate more tax revenue, and out of the additional tax revenue, we will give them a portion of that back, which will help to reduce their cost. The investment that they come make in Georgia, that will create more jobs. Uh, you'll see it from our education facilities at Georgia State and SCAD down in Savannah. There'll be more students interested in this industry. They'll go to school, and there'll be jobs here for them to go to work on, uh, you know, on production sets, either in the TV business or in the film business. Uh, and uh, it's going to make a big, big difference to our economy here in the state of Georgia. In the 1980s, Georgia ranked third in film production among the 50 states. Senator Sebaugh hopes his bill will bring back those prosperous times. A Senate resolution that would set the ground rules for redistricting passed out of the Senate Reapportionment Committee today. Committee Chairman Chip Rogers said Senate Resolution 166 will help make redistricting a more understandable process. Democratic Senator Vincent Fort believes that Republican leaders are concentrating on the wrong issues. I think we set forth the ground rules to begin with. Uh, everyone will know what's expected. Uh, and I, I believe, as you saw by the vote today, this was overwhelmingly uh, supported. And uh, we believe that this resolution uh, sets forth the standard uh, that makes this a very fair process. But the bottom line is that the U.S. Supreme Court has said that these districts are legal. And uh, let's get on with, you know, real uh, service to the people of Georgia, education, health care, etc. Senate Resolution 166 now goes to Senate rules. The actual maps are expected to come up in the reapportionment committee next Thursday. Meanwhile, a bill that would increase the waiting period from 30 days to as long as six months when seeking a divorce in Georgia passed unanimously out of the Senate Judiciary Committee today. Senate Bill 25 would also require divorcing couples with children to attend a four-hour class about helping the children involved with the divorce cope. Proponents of the bill say the waiting period would decrease the likelihood of divorce and preserve the sanctity of marriage. Those in opposition to the bill claim that a longer waiting period would lengthen the period of tension and in some cases increase domestic violence. Children of divorce also are more than twice as likely to have learning deficiencies, that, that more, more than twice as likely to drop out of school. It's for, those, it's for these children who are suffering, and we're spending state money. The time during the divorce process is the time of highest conflict, highest tension. From the time a couple decides to get a divorce to the time when the divorce is final, that's when things are typically very heated, very painful, very contentious. 
after the divorce is final, in most cases, the tension starts to subside. And in, in, in many cases, a healing process begins. What I'm afraid this bill may well do is extend the period of high tension, expend, extend the period of high conflict, and postpone the time when the conflict can be resolved and, and the healing can begin to occur. Senate Bill 25 now heads to the Senate Rules Committee. The House Judicial Subcommittee met today to consider House Bill 221, child support legislation. One of the key issues discussed was the adjusting of child support payments based on how much time the non-custodial parent spends with the child. Representative Sue Burmeister introduced the bill to the committee. Representative Mary Margaret Oliver had some questions about the legislation. Do you think it should be the policy of Georgia to allow a payor of child support to stop paying child support? If he, he or she loses their job regardless of their assets? Um, I think that it is extremely difficult when a person paying child support loses their job and is trying to feed themselves and keep a, a roof over their own heads and they fall, fall deeper and deeper into a rearage and then they're thrown in jail, they can lose their driver's license and it just mounts up. If they're in jail, they cannot work. The subcommittee plans to reconvene next Thursday to discuss this issue further. Well, students, parents, and educators today rallied in support of a bill which would allow parents more time to participate in their children's school activities. Lawmakers Michael Riddle has more on House Bill 230. House Bill 230, the Time for Schools Act, is sponsored by Representative Roger Bruce, but he had some help in drafting the legislation. This bill was generated by the thought from students. I went to A. Philip Randolph Elementary School. A week later, they called me back and they said, Representative Bruce, you told us our bills get passed. Now we want one passed. We went back. They had formed their own committee, their own organization, and they decided that they wanted their parents to be able to spend more time at the schools to make sure that their education was what it needed to be. If the kids are smart enough to figure it out, why is not the legislature? Nine other states have a law similar to House Bill 230, which is currently in the Industrial Relations Committee. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Michael Riddle. And coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, it's Legislative Day 21, and the Senate will be in recess so they can attend the funeral of former Senator Paul Brown, but the House will meet and take up legislation. Senator Preston Smith will introduce legislation designed to save the lives of teen drivers in an interview with Chancellor Thomas Meredith about a new educational partnership called Education Go Get It. The program is designed to increase Georgia's high school graduation rate. We'll have those stories and all the latest from Under the Gold Dome. That's tomorrow at 7 p.m. Meanwhile, if you missed any part of this broadcast, tune in when Lawmakers is rebroadcast tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. on GPB. Now stay tuned for Prep Sports Plus. That program is coming up next here on Georgia Public Broadcasting. And that's our broadcast for this, the 20th legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Wandy Lawson. And I'm Gerald Bryan. For all of us here at Lawmakers, good night. Good night. This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.